Okay. Everybody, good evening. And we're going to begin our study with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath that's coming and for the fellowship that we can have. We pray for those who are here and those that wish they could be here in this study. Uh, we pray for Dwight, that you can help him to recover, uh, that he'll be feeling better for tomorrow morning's presentation and um, for the presentation on Sunday morning as well. Yeah, we pray for all the studies um, that this movement is doing in various places on the earth. We know, Lord, that you are leading us and guiding us into all truth through thy spirit. And we pray, Lord, that as we continue to look at the three angels' messages and righteousness by faith, that your Holy Spirit can speak to us. We know that there is much that we do not understand, many ideas that um, have creeped into Adventism and this movement even um, that have clouded the issues. And so we ask, Lord, that you can give us clear vision, clear sight. Be with us now as we open your word together. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> as you look at the notes here, we're, we started on this study, and I'm just going to do a really brief review of these notes. Um, so what we had looked at, the first part, had to do really with the first, second, and third angels' messages. And the idea uh, that we came to understand quite clearly after July 18th is that we had misapplied Ellen White's statement regarding uh, the, the repeating to the very letter in that we had applied it to the first, second, and third angels' messages. But if we read her statement, it's quite clear that it's the first and second angels' messages that is the parable of the ten virgins that is has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter. So we know that the messages all need to be repeated. But when she talks about the experience of, of Millerite history, the first and second angels' messages, those messages that are repeated to the very letter, in order that Adventists can be prepared for the Sunday law, which is going to be um, connected to the third angels' message being empowered. And so we know that uh, the third angel's message arrived on October 22nd, 1844, and that is going to be joined in Revelation 18 by the second angel. And that since it's joined by the second angel, you can't have a second without a first, just like you can't have a third without a first and second. That means that the first angel's message must also occur prior to the angel of Revelation 18 joining the third. And so this movement has been predicated upon this idea that um, we are having the first and second angel's message preceding the third. That it was we have to repeat something because it was rejected. So the first and second angel's messages, and even the third angel's message is rejected um, in the first generation, because we know the third angel's message is given at the end of the first generation in 1888, and it's going to be rejected. But we are still under the proclamation of the third, even if that mes message was rejected. And we're still under the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages. The problem is the knowledge of these messages are lost. And so the first and second angel's messages are repeated, and the third is repeated. But when she talks about repeated to the very letter, she's referring to the first and second angels' messages. So that's one of the things that we talked about. Now, we had also looked at this um, uh, vision that she had, which is in regard to Nashville, and that um, and the reason that we looked at this um, had to do with this um, one is the map I'm trying to remember uh, what specifically what it was here because she has this map 
that she sees, and there's all these lights. Oh yeah, and these jets of light. Um, so, so there's something here that you're going to see later when we we read uh, um, this here. And where is it? Oh, there was something else. I can't see it right now. Um, anyway, it'll come back to me at some point. I mean, I know we talked about it. I just don't see what it was. There was some key word in there. But anyway, we, then we started looking at the Advent Movement Illustrated. So they, these are from early writings. There's two different illustrations that Alan White gives of the Advent Movement. And what we read uh, last Friday was um, this first part dealing with the first angel's message. Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And, and she talks about people receiving the light and people rejecting the light. And this goes with Leona Dawson's study from Sabbath, where she, uh, whether, and I'm not sure where she got to in the study, uh, but she gives a quotation from Jeff. And this quotation says, I'll find it here. Okay. Yes, here it is. Um, a three-step process, the everlasting gospel, is the work of Christ in producing and thereafter demonstrating two classes of worshipers based upon a three-step prophetic testing message. So this is a quote from Jeff. And now I've always said it in a different order, that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message uh, that produces and demonstrates or de uh, develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So, so you could say it differently, a different order. It's still the same idea. And so when we're dealing with the everlasting gospel, this is the first, second, and third angel's message. So one of the things I, I, I started with, this basic premise of what we're going to see, and that is there is in Adventism this idea that righteousness by faith is the third angel's message alone. That is, the first and second angel's messages aren't righteousness by faith. Because Ellen White says righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. And the case is made, I believe, in, in reading the spirit of prophecy, that what she means by that is that when we get to the third angel's message, righteousness by faith is then demonstrated. So the third angel's message is this development and this demonstration of these two classes of worshipers, those that receive the mark of the beast and those that receive the seal of God. What we can't conclude is then that the first angel's message is not righteousness by faith and the second angel's message is not righteousness by faith, but it's only the third. But if we know the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message, then every single one of those steps is a step in righteousness by faith. And see, so Leona's study, if you, um, if you have that, I might send it out uh, again, because uh, it was sent out from the American group, or the Canadian group, I guess, I got it from. Um, oh, the chords. That was, uh, yeah, another issue dealing with the chords. So that's going to be... Um, so just a note there in the chat of the chords. Um, false doctrines and other teachings. And, and here are the chords that bind these groups when we get into this again. These chords are really the denominations. They're doctrines and teachings um, that are binding them. And that the gospel is going to free people from that. So... Um, so I'm just going to review this again. So I'm going to review this first part of the Advent Movement Illustrated. She says, I saw a number of companies that seemed to be bound together by cords. Many of these companies were in total darkness. Their eyes were directed downward to the earth, and there seemed to be no connection between them and Jesus. But scattered through these different companies were persons whose countenances looked light and whose eyes were raised to heaven. Beams of light from Jesus 
like rays from the sun were imparted to them. An angel bade me look carefully, and I saw an angel watching over every one of those who had a ray of light, while evil angels surrounded those who were in darkness. I heard the voice of an angel cry, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, which is the first angel's message. So we know that when we have a um, reform line, what, what does a reform line start with? It's a trick question. People need to be a bit vocal. Darkness. You raise up a reformer. Okay, so first you, as Angela said, you have a period of darkness. And in order to have a, a, a reform line, you're going to have a message uh, which is going to be attached to an increase of light. So you're going to have a reformer raised up. He's going to have an increase of light. And then he's going to proclaim the message. And that message will then be empowered. So, um, but there is, there's no need to have uh, a reform line if there is no darkness. Because the reform line answers that darkness. So that's why we see here these companies that were in total darkness. We can see that it's starting a reform line. And that um, these people are bound together by cords. So now this light comes, and it's going to be the light of the first angel's message. She says, a glorious light then rested down upon these companies to enlighten all who would receive it. Some of those who were in darkness received the light and rejoiced. Others resisted the light from heaven, saying that it was sent to lead them astray. So we had a little bit of discussion about this last Friday. But one of the things we can see here is that there are two classes, two different groups of people responding to this light, some receiving it and rejoicing in it, others resisting it and seeing it as a deception meant to lead them astray. But these people are in darkness, and when that light passes away from them, they were left in darkness. They didn't receive that light. So one of the things we see about a reform line is that darkness doesn't just end when the first angel's message arrives. Darkness is there all the way through the reform line. It, it, it starts in a period of darkness, but that darkness maybe to some degree is lessened because of the light, but also because people reject the light, they're going to go into deeper darkness. Now, this, this answers the question, why doesn't God just show us everything all at once? Why doesn't he just reveal himself to us and demonstrate his righteousness so that we can believe in him? Why does he not do that? Because we couldn't bear it. Okay, we couldn't bear it. And, and we see actually a demonstration of this. This is the story of the Exodus and the Israelites coming out of Egypt. God is going to reveal and manifest himself in a way that, you know, could destroy them, except that, you know, he's using Moses as, as a, a type of mediator uh, between them. But the people don't, they can't handle this light because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And this, in, in a personal way, is what happens when we are converted. Light comes to us. How are we going to respond to that light? Many people respond by hiding from the light. And if you continue, eventually that light cannot reach you. And you can see that light as error, as dangerous. So, so some people are going to see this light as error. It's to lead them astray. So then they're left in darkness. Those who had received the light from Jesus joyfully cherished the increase of precious light, which was shed upon them. Their faces beamed with holy joy, while the, their gaze was directed upward to Jesus with intense interest. And their voices were heard in harmony with the voice of the angel. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. So not only do they receive this light, they also become transmitters of this light. As they raised this cry, I saw those who were in darkness thrusting them with side and with shoulder. Then many who cherished 
the sacred light broke the cords which confined them. So this is going to be them breaking away from the various denominations and stood out separated from those companies. And as they were doing this, men belonging to the different companies and revered by them passed through, some with pleasing words and others with wrathful looks and threatening gestures and fastened the cords which were weakening. These men were constantly saying, God is with us. We stand in the light. We have the truth. I inquired who these men were, and it was told that they were ministers and leading men who had rejected the light themselves and were unwilling that others should receive it. People feel that if others are to receive this light, it will bring condemnation upon them. And so they try to withhold light from others. And then it, she says, I saw those who cherish the light looking upward with ardent desire, expecting Jesus to come, right? So this is what happens under the first angel's message. And to take them to himself. Soon a cloud passed over them and their faces were sorrowful. I inquired the cause of this cloud and was shown that it was their disappointment. So this would be the disappointment in the spring of 1844. The time when they expected their savior had passed and Jesus had not come. As discouragement settled upon the waiting ones, the ministers and leading men whom I had before noticed rejoiced, and all those who had rejected the light triumphed greatly, while Satan and his evil angels also exalted. So this is where we left off last Friday. So you can see we're moving into the second angel's message. Then I heard the voice of another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. A light shone upon those desponding ones, and with ardent desires for his appearing, they again fixed their eyes upon Jesus. I saw a number of angels conversing with the one who had cried, or who had, who had cried, Babylon is fallen. And these united with him in the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So we can see quite clearly what happened in 1844 is the first, well, the first angel's message is rejected by uh, the Protestant churches. They push out those who um, are receiving this light, and they come to recognize that the Protestant churches constitute Babylon. And so they give the message Babylon is fallen. But this is also going to be united in the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So this cry is the midnight cry. Now, um, why do we have these two messages under the second angel's message? Why is it this twofold message? Babylon is fallen, and behold, the bridegroom cometh. I mean, there's there's some symbolic things, but there's also some practical aspects to this. So why the two messages? Somebody can give us some insight into this. Because maybe because it both happened simultaneously. It it it, it well they happen simultaneously. Yeah, they yeah, happen. Well, they happen at the same period of time. Let's put it that way. Okay, they do, but it's not just a coincidence that they happen at the same period of time. There's something about these two messages of why they need to exist together. I mean, when we look at the parable of the ten virgins, we know that both the wise and the foolish are going to, um, to go to sleep while the bridegroom tarries. And in the parable of the ten virgins, of course, it doesn't say anything about Babylon, but, it, um, but there is an implication of something happening here. Because we have wise and foolish. Right. So remember, the everlasting gospel is a three step testing prophetic message, developing and demonstrating two classes of worshipers. So if you have two classes because you have the first message. Uh, the question is. Where are the two classes developed? So 
Why, why the second angel? Why couldn't we just have a two-step testing prophetic message? Why couldn't we just have the first angel's message? You have a message. If you accept it, you'll be the wise. And if you reject it, you'll be the foolish. Why is there this second angel's message that precedes the third? It has to call somebody out that the church has done. Okay. Right. So so we know that it's it's yeah, we have this separation of the classes. Right? So this is what happens under the second angel's message. Now you could say the first angel's message leads to this separation, but now you need this sort of demonstration of the one class particularly, that is the the foolish. That is, when you have the close of probation for the first message, because there is a close of probation, the Protestants close their probation. Those that had heard the message, understood it and rejected it, they're not going to be benefited by the second angel's message. Of course, not everyone heard the message or fully understand it, stood it. So the ones who um, come in under the second angel's message, because some people do, though not many, um, Mostly what you're going to see is a demonstration, though, of that separation that occurred because of the first angel's message. But it's mostly a demonstration, at least initially, of the wicked. Because what did the wicked do? What did the foolish do after the first disappointment? What, what, what occurs in a reform line at that point? We have a, a term that we use. Okay, there's a falling away. What about the mocking? Is the mocking marked there? I just went through that experience, so, but the person that did this to me is not a God-fearing person. In fact, he ca calls Christians people of meek minds. It was three days of discussing things with this person, and today he said that he was totally cutting me off. So I poured out my soul to this guy, you know, my, my, his blood it will not be on my hands. I'm still praying for him. But I'm telling you, when people reject the truth, they're extremely vicious. They can be very vicious. And the Lord gave me such a peace. And I said, you cannot hurt me because I'm very secure in my heavenly father's love. Yeah. Okay. So when somebody mocks, why do they mock? When they're in error, what 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 is it? What's the mechanism? What because they're full of self righteousness and they're they're fully convinced that their way is the only way, their opinion is the only truth, and then they start the blame shifting. And I said, all you are doing is is projecting your problems, your traits on me. And I said, everything you're bringing up, I've already studied, and I know you're wrong. And I tried to present the truth. And I, I really believe that, like I really prayed before I, I entered into this. And I really believe the Lord spoke to me, although after I reflected, I thought maybe I was too harsh. But it had to come to a point okay. where I had to say, no, I said, you're not going to change. Try to, try to change me to your cart because your cart is going to perdition. I'm going on with God. And then he finally said. I'm cutting you off. You're not going to have any more contact with me or my family. Well, that doesn't really answer. And I thought, well, I, who are you, God? You know, like, who are you to, to arbitrate this? But I'll have to respect his wishes. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at is what is the psychological mechanism? What is the, the, um, uh, the utility of mocking from the point of, the, of those that rejected light? To bring you down, to, to make you acquiesce to their demands. I won't do it. I'm very firm in what I believe in. I have a relationship with Christ. I still love this fellow. I love his soul. I would love to see him in heaven. I even told him that. But nope, you just rejected everything. I said, you're totally blind. You're spiritually blind. And I said, I'm going to continue to pray that you will be free from the snares of Satan. Okay. So, yeah. So, you gave me too much information there. So, can you put it in? Simpler terms, what you think the psychological mechanism is 
self-righteousness. Okay, that's not a psychological mechanism. That's something that uh, people have. They're trying to do, mocking is trying to accomplish something for them. Not, it's not really about you. To bolster their ego. And I don't bolster egos. I, I crush egos. Okay. Because I'm not into this narcissistic garbage. Okay. Well, yeah. So you're still not really <laughs> what I want. Because you're giving too much information for one. It should be. It, would, it wouldn't be jealousy, would it? Okay. Well, that's what's happening. But I'm talking more about why. They lack understanding. Okay. What's that, Rosanna? They, they lack understanding. Okay, but there's a reason why they mock. It provides some particular need that those who rejected light have. Well, you know what it is to be very, very, uh, maybe a little vulgar? It's mental masturbation. It's spiritual masturbation. They get a satisfaction out of putting other people down. Okay. Because okay, so they're putting They're trying to down. fill some gap in their own lives. Some, some, defect in their own lives okay so does the person on some level know that they've rejected light yes yes i i know he does right so they know they've rejected light but the only way that they can convince themselves or the least that they try to convince themselves is by representing the other person who has light in a negative light that is, they're trying to they're trying to put the thing that's in them. They're trying to put it on you, so that they can think of themselves as okay. It doesn't really work, but that's the utility of mockery. And anytime I see mockery, almost any time, it depends, because God does mock the wicked, but that's a different thing altogether, because it's God for one. But when I see people mocking others, then I know that there's something wrong with the person who's mocking, that there is some reason. Oh, and, and I see it all the time. I mean, I see it. I saw it in this movement. Uh, when I first came into this movement uh, on Facebook, I would have people who were believing the truth, the 2520, mocking other people. And, and I could pretty much guarantee that those people who were mocking would not be long in this message. And I was right. Every single person who was a mocker uh, quickly left the message, as, especially as more light arose. And, and the mocking that they did against those who you know, hadn't accepted the truth of this message, now they, they mocked the message itself and those who had received greater light than them. So, so if you find yourself mocking someone, you need to take a hard look at why you're mocking them. So, so that's, you know, that's, that's part of what, what's happening here. We have this, this, this group that's going to mock. Now, the other thing that we have, of course, is we have these two messages. So the question that I had is why there's two messages. So we have this separation of the one class, but we also have an increase of light. So under the first message, we had an increase of light. And under the second angel's message, we have an increase of light. So when we look at the parable of the ten virgins, and we see that both classes slumbered and slept. But when the cry went out at midnight, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The wise had oil in their vessels, um, but the foolish did not. And they had not done the necessary preparation. Now, why not? I mean, this is a parable. It's an illustration of something. But what is it? What is it about the foolish class that they're unprepared, that they don't accept the midnight cry? They ain't using the mill, Miller's rules. Okay, so so that's well. I don't know if that would necessarily be true. I mean, they're Millerites, right? These are Millerites. They are not uh, hypocrites. 
Many of them are slumbering and sleeping. My understanding is that this is uh, the group of Millerites who are then separated from the other group of Millerites who accept the midnight cry. And when we look at April 19, 1844, we're going to have uh, many of these people who were Millerites are then going to mock. They're going to join the mockers of, of the world in mocking the Adventists who are still holding on to this message and haven't abandoned it. And we saw that happen in this movement a number of times. Um, so, so the foolish have closed their probation, but the wise are accepting this light. And, and that's what Ellen White sees. She sees them accepting this light and uh, so we're, we're going to go on here. So she says, um, uh, I read the part. Okay, here we are. The musical voices of these angels seem to reach everywhere. And we know, of course, that this is not really angels. This is a vision, and it's it's a symbolic representation of what happened. So we know that this, this message is being illustrated by uh, a symbol of musical voices. And that's going to be the, the midnight cry. An exceeding bright and glorious light shone all shone around those who had cherished the light, which had been imparted to them. Their faces shone with excellent glory, and they united with the angels in the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So just like we have um, the, them giving the first angel's message, Fear God and give glory to him, we're going to see here, they're going to say, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. As they harmoniously raised the cry among the different companies, those who rejected the light pushed them and with angry looks scorned and derided them. But angels of God wafted their wings over the persecuted ones, while Satan and his angels were seeking to press their darkness around them, to lead them to reject the light from heaven. So we know that... Um, You know, there's a lot of pressure put on those who accept light. And so Satan tries to do everything to bring discouragement upon those who accept truth. Then I heard a voice saying to those who had been pushed and derided, come out from among them and touch not the unclean. In obedience to this voice, a large number broke the cords which bound them. Right. So this is the leaving of Babylon, coming out of Babylon and leaving the companies that were in darkness joined those who had previously gained their freedom and joyfully united their voices with them. I heard the voice of earnest, agonizing prayer from a few who still remained with the companies that were in darkness. Ministers and leading men were passing around in these different companies, fastening the cords more firmly, but I still heard this voice of earnest prayer. Then I saw those who had been praying reach out their hands for help, Toward the united company who were free, rejoicing in God, the answer from them, as they earnestly looked to heaven and pointed upward, was, Come out from among them and be separate. I saw individuals struggling for freedom, and at last they broke the cords that bound them. They resisted the efforts which were made to fasten the cords tighter and refused to heed the repeated assertions, God is with us, we have the truth with us. And so... We can see what this is illustrating in Millerite history, that there is still this struggle for many to come out from among them and be separate. Now, when we look at this movement, as we're going to see as we go through these studies, and, and its relationship to righteousness by faith, this is one of the most difficult aspects of this message. And and one is because it's often misconstrued. That is, we saw with many, and, and particularly uh, my knowledge of Tabo, is that when he was looking at the church, one is he was never very connected to the church. He'd not really been an Adventist long. And um, when he was um, working with Parminder, they believed that they needed to set up a new church organization and call people out of Adventism. So they would take something like this, come out from among them and be separate and say, since we're repeating Millerite history, the same thing has to happen in our history. We have to separate. 
from those that haven't accepted the truth and we need to have our own denomination, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, they had the, the movement doesn't sin and the church triumphant. All these ideas were being developed uh, 2000, uh, in 2018 um, and then fully developed. We saw their results in 2019. So this can't be talking about um, the Adventist church becoming Babylon and that us becoming some new church. Uh, but it does represent uh, coming out of Babylon and, and not to be controlled by these doctrines, relationships. So there is a... Uh, okay, we know the church, is, the Adventist church is not Babylon, but is, is, are many Adventists in Babylon, or is Babylon in the church? That is, are many people... Um, enslaved by Babylon who are Seventh-day Adventists, even though the church is not Babylon. It's being run by Babylon. Okay. Um, if we look at the time of Christ, was the Jewish church Babylon? Or was it worse than Babylon? Because they rejected the light. Okay. And we know in Adventist history, the Protestant churches are part of Babylon, right? In Millerite history, the Protestant churches are part of Babylon. So Adventists leave the Protestant churches to join this movement, and, and they no longer attend those churches. They're no longer associated with those churches in this period. Um, from April 19th, 1844 to October 22nd, 1844. This is a calling out of Babylon. So, so we have this problem that we can then take that history, and if we're going to say now we are going to come out of Babylon, what is it that we're going to come out of? Because if we believe that there's Babylon, we'd have to identify it and what it means to come out of it. Because this is... You come out. What's that? Come out of, you're coming out of religious confusion. Or confusion. Okay. So, if, if, if this is just a message to come out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and to join this movement, what would be the problem with that? Why would we say that that's not what this, how we would apply it to our time. Because I've seen it applied that way in this movement. The Ch Adventist church is now part of Babylon, and we need to come out of the Adventist church. But is that, what, is that how we would make this application? No, we just supposed to reach the lost house of Israel. Okay, so, so we're dealing with Israel, right? We're not dealing with Babylon. Right. But Babylon is in the church. Yeah. Okay. So, so we know that this Babylon that they have to come out of is not some church organization in our time. It, it has to do with some kind of teaching or understanding or message that we have to come out of. Because there's many people who leave the Adventist church, but they're still just as much in Babylon as they were before. Whether it's this message or anywhere else. So we need to understand what this is about. Now, if, if we read this sentence again, I saw individuals struggling for freedom and at last they broke the cords that bound them. If I saw this out of this context, out of context, I just saw this sentence there what would how would we generally interpret this this sentence when it when a, when an individual is struggling for freedom and at last breaks the cords that bound them what cords would we generally think of 
How would we generally apply this? Now, we never read this this paragraph. We just have this quote, you know, in the spirit of prophecy, and 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 we were reading it. What would we think she's talking about? Well, the courts of Babylon, okay. Babylon, Babylon's yes, dog, dog, dogmas. Okay, but you're looking at it in this context. I'm just saying, if we saw it out of context, if we just had this statement as a stray sentence, what would we generally think of struggling for freedom and breaking cords? We would think it's what? Slavery, coming out of slavery. Okay, coming out of slavery, right? Because this is what's illustrated. And that is uh, an illustration of what step in the steps of salvation because there's a three-step testing prophetic message well the first i mean you have to realize that you, you are a sinner and you need a savior now the person i'm talking to thinks he's his own savior and okay. he's calling me a narcissist so we have justification justification is god forgives us for our sins we're declared as righteous but we know there's this step of sanctification and is somebody who can we have freedom from the cords of sin that bind us if we only have justification many christians think we just have justification so if you think yeah we have to be forgiven of sin every day we have to confess and forsake sin every single day it's an ongoing battle okay so when somebody just has justification though and doesn't believe in sanctification they believe i'm going to continue sinning you know jesus has justified me he's cleansed me from my sin i don't need to worry about my sin uh because i'm going to keep sinning all i need is christ's righteousness to cover me that's a common idea that's not an adventist idea we know that justification occurs but if you stopped at justification are you going to be demonstrating are you going to be truly free from the cords that bound you no and i've been there because i used to believe in that what say all the say Right. Okay. So on, you still have your old, you still have your old garment on. You take off the old garment. Yeah. So one is we have to have the filthy garment removed from us, and we have to be cleansed. Chain. Uh, 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 we have to have a change of raiment. So we have to be uh, have that raiment, Christ's righteousness, placed upon us. But we also have to walk in newness of life. So the second step. This second angel's message that's being talked about here is an illustration of the of sanctification. Now, so we said righteousness by faith is demonstrated in each of these angels' messages. That it's not just the third angel's message that is righteousness by faith, but it's all three messages. Righteousness by faith is just the third angel's message in verity, in demonstration. It's demonstrating the completion of that work of righteousness by faith when you come to that third test but you can't come to that third test you can't have glorification or judgment if you haven't gone through the first two tests if you haven't gone through justification and sanctification you can't experience glorification or the judgment different people use different words here but we know that in the third test, in the third step, we demonstrate the everlasting gospel in reality. That is, we are now demonstrating Christ's character. Now, in sanctification, we also are, right? And, and even in justification, to some degree, we also are. But it's progressive. It's a three-step testing prophetic message. It's progressive. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Christ's character seen upon his people. But you, you need sanctification. You need to actually produce righteousness. You have, Christ has to produce righteousness in you. 
if you continue to sin, that justification won't do you any good. Now, of course, you know, we go through this process all the time. We come to Christ, we, we ask for him to forgive us and to help us, to justify us. We see ourselves as sinners. And then we, we continue to try to walk with him. And, and sure, we don't always walk perfectly because we're growing in righteousness. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. It is coming closer to the character of Christ through the experiences and trials we suffer. But there comes a point when we're going to have to demonstrate Christ's character. And this is what the church hates. They have given it a label called last generation theology. And it's basically what Jones and Wagner taught, and they admit this, and what Ellen White taught. And they also admit this to some degree, and people like Emma Andreessen, and they say that this is an error, this is a misunderstanding of the gospel. And, and they sort of mock it, like you're going to have a bunch of little Christs, you know, during the time of Jacob's trouble and this type of thing. So I've heard pastors mock this whole idea. Um, but this is Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. That happens under... The third. So, Chris, you have a comment? Yes, I do. Um, I was reading um, from Desire of Ages, page 310. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting. It kind of fits right in with what you're talking about. It says, men may profess faith in the truth, but if it does not make them sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, heavenly minded, it is a curse to its possessors, and through their influence, it is a curse to the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sadly, we've experienced this in our own lives. I mean, sure, we've experienced it in other people's lives, but that, that doesn't really do us much good. But we've experienced this in our own walk at times, that we've actually been a reproach to Christ rather than a revelation of Christ's character. And so... Right now, this movement is, I believe, experiencing this work of sanctification so that it can then demonstrate, be lifted up as an enzyme. And so one of the things we saw about July 18th is that this movement was unready. It was unprepared for the events that, that we were uh, predicting. That is, we, we would not have been able to... Um, demonstrate Christ's character because we couldn't even demonstrate it among ourselves. Jealousies, all envyings, um, strifes, all kinds of things were existing in this movement. And if the prediction had been fulfilled on July 18th, it wouldn't have changed us. We would have still been the same. And of course, we saw this then demonstrated after the disappointment of what kind of characters we actually have. So, um, so we have those who were praying. They reach out their hands for help toward the united company who were free rejoicing in God, right? So they're going to come out. They're going to also experience this freedom. They resisted the efforts which were made to fasten the cords tighter and refused to heed the repeated assertions, God is with us, we have the truth with us. Now, this assertion, God is with us, we have the truth with us. Why is this the assertion? It, why is it always the assertion for those that have rejected light? And it, it is so funny when it happens, not, not in a humorous way, but just oddly. Um, that you will see this sort of boasting that someone has the truth when really by doing so, they're demonstrating the very fact they do not have the truth. Because what is what, what kind of words come out of the mouth of those who actually have the truth, who are demonstrating Christ's character? Well, if you disagree, then they, they do a personal attacks. 
Okay, but somebody who has Christ's character, what what kind of oh. words come out of his mouth? Or the, they or, would be giving a warning. Yeah. So one is they would be um, they would look at themselves not as righteous, right? If somebody says God is with us, we have the truth with us. Um, it's just that it, it, I call it schoolyard talk. You know, when somebody's insecure, they're in error. You know, they've had some kind of conflict. They have to convince themselves somehow that they're in the right. But if we look at the 144,000, their, their response is, um, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They fear lest they've done something that has been a reproach to Christ, that they have sins that have gone unconfessed. When the gospel has done a work upon us, it's going to affect a change. And when you see people exalting, you know that that person is in error. Um, I had this experience once when I was um, discussing. Yeah, so um, Iran says a thing here about uh, they want to get a reflection of self. Um, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. That's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. So I had this experience um, on Facebook. I was having this discussion, and I, I was ganged up on. There was a four of them, I believe, who were... Um, trying to attack what I was presenting in Isaiah chapter 7. And somebody, uh, I, I guess what they done, had done, it had misread um, a, uh, a word in, or something in, in Hebrew. Um, and, and they all thought that they had found the thing to prove me wrong. And then they just jumped on me and they were just like, I mean, obviously, it's just text, but basically, um, uh, shouts of joy were coming from this group. I mean, when you could see what they were writing down, you could see that they felt that they had triumphed and, and I was defeated. And they say, you have to admit you're wrong and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, I finally pointed out where they had made this mistake and um you know, where they had misread the text. They'd look at the wrong word or something like that. I can't remember exactly what happened. Uh, but they were a little bit deflated. But, but the point was, if I was discussing with somebody and trying to win them over, the one thing I would never do is exalt and, you know, you're wrong, I'm right, you know, you need to admit it. Um, I mean, one is you're not going to win that person to Christ. Correct. Exactly. And and every in every interaction we have with others, we need to be seeking to save. And and it doesn't matter if we're right. Just because we're right doesn't make us right. I know that sounds like it doesn't make sense, but to be right, in the sense to have a right idea, right thinking, doesn't make us right with God. Having, having a knowledge of the truth does not save us. And if we're just arguing with others, if we're just seeking to, to prove other people wrong, even if we do have the truth, we're not acting like Christ acted. Yeah, we see how Christ dealt with the Pharisees, you know. Yeah, so then she says, persons were continually leaving the companies that were in darkness and joining the free company, who appeared to be in an open field raised above the earth. Their gaze was directed upward, the glory of God rested upon them, and they joyfully shouted his praise. They were closely united and seemed to be wrapped in the light of heaven. Around this company were some who came under the influence of the light, but who were not particularly united to the company. All who cherished the light shed upon them shed upon them were gazing upward with intense interest, and Jesus looked upon them with sweet approbation. They expected him to come and longed for his appearing. 
They did not cast one lingering look to earth, but again a cloud settled upon the waiting ones, and I saw them turn their weary eyes downward. I inquired the cause of this change, said my accompanying angel. They are again disappointed in their expectations. Jesus cannot yet come to earth. They must endure great, greater trials for his sake. They must give up errors and traditions received from men and turn wholly to God in his word. They must be purified, made white, and tried. Three steps, right? Those who endure that bitter trial will, will obtain an eternal victory. So when we look at these steps, the first, second, and third step, and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Leona's notes. She has this laid out here. Um, so just hang on a second. A uh, little chart that she made. Um, there we go. So this is this pattern. And, and we see a few of them here. Revelation 14, verse 6. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. You have fear God, give glory, judgment. These three steps. John 16, verse 8. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. This is talking about the comforter coming. And when he comes, he shall convince the world of sin, of righteousness of ju and judgment. Sin, because they believe not on me. On righteousness, because I go to my Father. And on judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And Ellen White adds, and he will soon be cast out. And then this one here that she already referred to, purified, made white, and tried. In Revelation 3.18, gold, white raiment, and eye salve. Right, so these, these three different uh, aspects. The way, the truth, and the life. The courtyard, the holy place, the most holy place. It's justification, sanctification, and glorification. Called, chosen, faithful. So she, um, she says here, Leona Dawson, righteousness by faith is the first and last step, the pattern of our journey, the gospel that is in and through Christ. We are given example after example of this process throughout the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Faith in Jesus is the golden thread that binds the pattern, the living pattern together, right? So this is righteousness by faith. And, and we're going to be looking at this in a lot more detail as uh, we go through this study to really understand it. And, and when, when I talk about detail, I'm talking really about historically within Adventism itself to look at how this, this message of righteousness by faith has been obscured, um, not just by the church, but also by Adventists who proclaim to be uh, reformers or conservatives, that they have, have darkened, uh, darken the message they've they've added things to the message and they've made it difficult for people to understand and 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 part of the thing is of course the enemy has in, in the present day we live in post a modern world and definitions have become hazy and um, um, there's all kinds of uh, rhetoric and use of language and framing of ideas that are meant to confuse people. So an example of this, which we're, we're going to go into detail in, in one of these studies later on, but um, back in the late 80s and in the, in the early and mid 90s, um, there was this debate regarding the nature of Christ. And the debate was, did Jesus have a sinful nature or a sinless nature? And what what ended up happening, how it ended up turning around, is that by redefining words, we were able to basically come to agreement in, in language while actually having quite different beliefs regarding what that language meant. So some people would say, well, Jesus has a sinless human nature. And by that, they would mean that Jesus was sinless but he had a human nature. Others would say, 
well, Jesus had a sinless human nature, so he had a different nature than you and I have. But Christ was sinless, but he had a human nature. So, so you could take those words and get them to mean something different. Um, but also on the side of those who uh, believed in Jones and Wagner's message, the 1888 message study committee, uh, we had, um, I can't think of his name, I always have trouble remembering his name, but Jeff wrote a book in response to, to his book. Desmond Ford. No, not Desmond Ford. Um, he was a part of the 1888 message study committee, and I can never remember his name. I'm bad with names, so um, uh, let me see if I can find it here quickly, because it's Jeff's book is in my books uh, folder. Um, I don't think I can find it really quickly. I'll have to. Uh, we're we're gonna look at it. We're actually gonna go through um, Jeff's book um, dealing with this. Uh, you know, he was he was he he was a con convert of uh, uh, Robert Wheeland. I think they were neighbors, and um, it's on the tip of my tongue. But anyway, we, we will look at that. So right now we're not going to look at it. But but the point is um, uh, how this message has been darkened. It's been twisted. So so we really need to understand these points. Um, so when we go on here, they, they have experienced a disappointment, right? They are again disappointed in their expectations. Jesus could not yet come to the earth. They must endure greater trials for his sake because we need to reflect his character perfect, perfectly. But also they must give up the errors and traditions received from men and turn wholly to God in his word. So this happened in Millerite history and it's happening in our history. That is, there's many things that we believe that are merely uh, errors and traditions received from men and those we have to give up. Uh, they must be purified, made white, and tried. So that three steps that we looked at. Those who endure the bitter trial will obtain an eternal victory. Jesus did not come to this to the earth as the waiting joyful company expected, to cleanse the sanctuary by the purifying, by purifying the earth by fire. I saw that they were correct in their reckoning of the prophetic periods. Prophetic time closed in 1844, and Jesus entered the most holy place to cleanse the sanctuary at the ending of the days. Their mistake consisted in not understanding what the sanctuary was and the nature of its cleansing. As I looked again at the waiting, disappointed company, they appeared sad. They carefully examined the evidences of their faith and followed down through the reckoning of the prophetic periods, but could discover no mistake. The time had been fulfilled. Where was their savior? They had lost him. Now this is, Ellen White's going to make a parallel to the dis disciples, the disappointment of the disciples. Um, but I'm first going to just go to our disappointment, to July 18, 2020. So when that disappointment occurred, um, the next day I, I did a presentation, and I said that there was basically a, a couple of options, a few options. One is that we were right as to the time, but wrong as to the event. We were wrong as to the time, but right as to the event. Or we were wrong both to the time and the event. So those are, I mean, we wouldn't argue that we were right to the time and the event, because the event never occurred. But, so we have three basic options. And my argument was, is that we are paralleling Millerite history and the time itself had to be correct. But our anticipation of what was going to occur at that time was the problem. And so we can see that this, in this error, they had a misunderstanding about the sanctuary and the nature of its cleansing. In our time, what would be this basic misunderstanding that we made 
in regard to our July 18, 2020 prediction. I've already alluded to it. And, and it's sort of a parallel to what she says here. Not literal, but symbolically. We thought it was, in a sense, going to be cleansed with fire July 18th, 2020. And some of us were very disappointed when it wasn't. Okay, so we have that, that literal aspect that there's going to be this, this event. Um, but wouldn't it be the, the real mistake that we made is not understanding how unready we were? Isn't that that we didn't really understand that the sanctuary needed to be cleansed? That is, we needed to be cleansed. If that event was going to uh, happen, we would have to be cleansed. We would Because if we're talking about being lifted up as an enzyme, and yet we have no Christ-like characters, um, we didn't realize the work that needed to be done, that we had to give up these errors and traditions received from men. But in our case, it's not even just intellectual ideas. It's ideas about ourselves, about this movement of who we are. So we were correct about July 18th, and, and we saw that afterwards, how everything laid out. But what we, we hadn't understood is that our message was typical. So we were in a typical line. So we didn't understand the lines fully. And in a sense, that's kind of what happened to the Millerites. Because they know that the hour of the Day of Atonement began October 22nd, 1844. But was it to also end on October 22nd, 1844 or October 23rd? Why they would think that it's going to end on a particular it's ongoing. Yeah, the contrast with them and us is that a lot of them were prepared for Christ to come. We're not. I mean, I know I'm not. I'm not perfected. No. Now, of course, we're not going to see ourselves as righteous. But one thing that we can quite clearly see is we are not, um, if we just look at the movement in general, um, we're not a united movement. We're not doing what God has asked. And, and so some change has to occur. And this is the time that we're in. We're in this this time from October 22nd, 1844. Um, and we looked at when we studied early writings, page 74, um, that basically we're in that same situation and that we need to follow this example, right? So what they're going to do is they're going to examine the evidences of their faith and they're going to find that they could they made no mistake as far as the reckoning of the prophetic periods. Now, not everyone in this movement, just like not everyone in Ellen White's day, followed that counsel. But I could see that if we had experienced the disappointment of October 22, 1844, in our July 18, 2020 prediction, then we would have to follow the same uh, uh, counsel, because Ellen White gives us this counsel in other places, the counsel to study thoroughly. And that wasn't done. There was some uh, pretensions of that regard from FFA. Uh, they set up some studies and so forth, uh, but they weren't really willing to look at anything. They they basically had already drawn their conclusion, and they just wanted they did basically uh, a mock up of this. It was not an effort made to really find out the reason for our disappointment. She says, I was shown the disappointment of the disciples as they came to the sepulcher and found not the body of Jesus. Mary said, they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Angels told the sorrowing disciples that their Lord had risen and would be, go before them into Galilee. So when we look at the disappointment of the disciples, we this parallel that Ellen White makes, uh, the first presentation I ever did, uh, in my local church after um, I'd been at the camp meeting in Oklahoma in November, is I, I preached, uh, I think it was on, around Christmas time. It was in December anyway, in, in 2010. And um, I preached on this. I got a little chart. I did actually a PowerPoint presentation. 
and I put up um, Ellen White's statements, I drew the lines and everything and showed the parallel between the disciples' disappointment and the Millerites' disappointment. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, it was actually, let me see here, just hang on a second. Um, Mary's lament is like ours will be in Jacob's time of trouble. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, it was December 25th, 2010 that I did my presentation. Um, so, um, and interestingly, that was 22 years, let me see, 18 years from the day of my baptism. Anyway, um, so, so when we see this parallel, we can see, of course, we have the same parallel. Uh, I mean, this is one of the main things about these lines is that these disappointments occur on various lines. <clears throat> so she says, in like manner, I saw that Jesus regarded with deepest compassion the disappointed ones who had waited for his coming, and he sent his angels to direct their minds that they might follow him where he was. He showed them that this earth is not the sanctuary, but that he must enter the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to make an atonement for his people and to receive the kingdom from his father, and that he would then return to the earth and take them to dwell with him forever. The disappointment of the first disciples well represents the disappointment of those who expected their Lord in 1844. I was carried back to the time when Christ rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. The joyful disciples believed that he was then to take the kingdom and reign a temporal prince. They followed their king with high hopes. They cut down the beautiful palm branches and took off their outer garments and with enthusiastic zeal spread them in the way. And some went before and others followed crying, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. The excitement disturbed the Pharisees, and they wished Jesus to rebuke his disciples. But he said unto them, If these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. The prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9 must be fulfilled. Yet the disciples were doomed to a bitter disappointment. In a few days, they followed Jesus to Calvary and beheld him bleeding and mangled upon the cruel cross. They witnessed his agonizing death and laid him in the tomb. Their hearts sank with grief. Their expectations were not realized in a single particular, and their hopes died with Jesus. But as he arose from the dead and appeared to his sorrowing disciples, their hopes revived. They had found him again. I saw that the dis disappointment of those who believed in the coming of the Lord in 1844 was not equal to the disappointment of the first disciples. Prophecy was fulfilled in the first and second angels' messages. They were given at the right time and accomplished the work which God designed to accomplish by them. And we can say all of these things about our prediction. One is we can say that the disappointment was not as great as the Millerites. But prophecy was fulfilled in the first and second angel's messages. So the first and second angel's message, messages, it's a three-step, remember the three angel's messages, the everlasting gospel, is a three-step testing prophetic message. It's prophetic. But in all of these examples, we have a disappointment. So we should have expected the disappointment in our history. And actually, we were, we were shown that we would. It wasn't, you know, well accepted. So here we come to these first and second angels' messages. Now notice in this example here, she's going to give the first and second angels' messages. Does she talk about the third angels' message being completed? So notice she doesn't in this illustration, because we know that the first and second angel's messages were given in Millerite history. The third angel's message 
is going to arrive at the end of that history, but it's going to take time for it to be proclaimed. Okay, so we have this other illustration. Um, and you're going to see that there are some similarities. The thing about this, this other illustration is it's, um, it's going to go through the same history. Um, what is the second? Uh, let me see here. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, there's some particular point that we're going to look at. But we're not going to look at this um, this evening. We're going to look at this tomorrow. Now, do we have any sort of comments or questions about what we're doing here in, in this study? Um, now, Angela says, Mary's lament is like ours, will be in the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, what particularly are you referring to in how it's like ours? We're talking about just occurred to me because she was saying they've taken away my lord and i know not where they have laid him i it's like my god my god why hast thou not forsaken me like where have you gone lord you know where do i stand with you at this moment and i can just feel that pain that anguish you know and then jesus was right there and she didn't even recognize him and i'm just thinking we go through that that experience those of us that are faithful and and will go through that experience the Lord will be right there. It's like our final test. Okay. So so this brings up a good point. Now, when we think about our personal three-step testing prophetic message, or at least our personal points of salvation, um, remember, we, we're in darkness, right? So we're sinners. We're in darkness. And light comes to us. And, and we respond to that light. And, and, and sometimes it takes quite a while. Um you know, for me, because I was converted when I was 17, I mean, that light had come to me long before, but um, it took a lot of experience for me to finally give my life to Christ and ask him to take over my life and to actually now actively be working with Christ in my walk that I was now walking with him. Before I wasn't. It was just knowledge about the Bible, about Jesus, intellectual arguments, understood you know the world was created by God I believed that the Bible was the Word of God and I even enjoyed reading the Bible but I wasn't converted and so when I came to God and gave my life to him he now was actively working in my life he was I was participating with him so now I went from darkness I had this light and and in a sense you could almost say that that uh, conversion experience within that first message of justification that there are steps within that message of justification that's that experience of justification and that basically the conversion is like the empowerment of the first angel's message right because there's a message there's an increase of light um sort of a formalization of the message we, we come to understand some things about god but then we finally are converted and that's justification But now we're going to go through the next step, the second stage, which is that day-to-day -day walk with Christ. Now that we've given our heart to Christ, are we going to be able to walk with him? One is we hardly even know um, what it is he requires of us. We know we're sinners, but now there's going to come more light. And for me personally, that was then uh, the knowledge of the state of the dead, the knowledge of the Sabbath, the knowledge of the sanctuary. Uh, becoming baptized as an Adventist and continuing to grow in understanding um, to the point where um, I was now not just, I, I knew the truth, right? And I was seeking every day to learn more of the truth and to walk in that light. Right? So that's the work of sanctification. And that's still where we're at, or where I'm at, is I'm seeing this light, I'm rejoicing in it. But now there's going to be an empowerment of it. And that empowerment is going to happen with the, with the arrival of the third angel's message. But when we become, when we stand at the Sunday law and we make that choice to stand for Christ, 
all along this we have to exercise faith and when we come to those major issues that's where we now are are struggling and we're going to give everything to Christ but when we have the Sunday law we know that it's progressive correct and where does it ultimately lead to Where do we see the it empowered in a sense? The third step empowered. I mean, usually I say it's at the Sunday law, but what about the time of Jacob's trouble? The 144,000 living in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, experiencing what Christ experienced upon a cross, the separation from the Father, and yet maintaining their integrity. That is the experience that we are to have. And we're not going to get there if we don't follow the light that God has given us. And if we're not converted, if we, we, if we haven't even experienced conversion, there's no way that we can expect to be one of the 144,000. And if we're not daily seeking to be sanctified, coming to Christ to asking him to help us, and to reveal to us things in our character that need to be changed, things that we have hidden from our own sight, things that we don't want to see. If we don't have that experience, there's no way that we can stand at the Sunday law. And many Adventists, many of us, believe that we can stand at the Sunday law, that we're not going to be deceived, and yet we're completely deceived about ourselves. We think we're better than we are. And so this work of the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith, as we go through this, we will, we will start to get a better concept of what this really means and experience uh, this, this message. That's, that's, the, that's what has to happen. Christ's character has to be seen upon his people. He needs a people who can represent him. And the church doesn't like that. Satan definitely doesn't want to have a people that represent Christ because then Christ can come. And then Satan will be defeated and he'll have to bear the responsibility for his sins and the sins of those that are unconfessed. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's... Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for the fellowship of your spirit, that we can unite our hearts together. Forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And help us to be representatives, living representatives of your law that it can be written upon our hearts and in our minds, that we can have a new heart, a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. We pray for this movement for all the people involved. We are thankful for the light that we have. We ask, Lord, that we can, you can give us the strength to walk in it. Help us to choose each day uh, to surrender to you. Be with us now. Be with all those studying these things. And um, we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.